Bien, nous allons recommencer avec pas plus de 20 minutes de retard. Alors, avant de donner la parole à Michael Rosenthal, je voudrais euh, deux, faire deux annonces. Alors, la première, rappeler à tout le monde que euh, on vous demande de parler en français ou en anglais lentement pour que euh, les gens de l'autre langue puissent suivre avec plus de facilité. Et deuxièmement, euh, je vais faire un peu de publicité. Il y a beaucoup d'années maintenant, vous aviez tous aimé le tome 1 de la traduction de Spinoza, des, des œuvres complètes de Spinoza par Curley. Alors maintenant, vous allez encore plus aimer le tome 2 qui a fini par paraître. Et, et j'espère que du coup, ça vous donnera l'espoir de voir bientôt paraître la traduction de l'éthique en français. Mais ça, c'est une autre question qui dépend des Hollandais. Bien, nous commençons donc euh, l'après-midi par euh, le couple rosenthal lagré Donc je donne tout de suite la parole à Michel Rosenthal. Can you hear me? Um, thank you very much to the organizers. Um... And it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to jump into this as quickly as I can so we can try to have some time for discussion. In the preface to part four uh, of the ethics, Spinoza writes, as far as good and evil are concerned, they indicate nothing positive in things considered in themselves, nor are they anything other than modes of thinking. But though this is so, still we must retain these words. It's particularly puzzling that in a treatise whose goal it is to discover the highest good in human life, Spinoza casts doubt on the most basic terms of this pursuit. I propose to explore the metaphysical and epistemological basis of this purported solution in more detail through an examination of a related set of terms, um, including beings of reason, antirationis, beings of the imagination, I won't have too much to say, this version of it, and fictitious ideas. Um, in an appendix to the classic work on Spinoza, his classic work, Marshall uh, Garou, pointed out that primary among the functions of beings of reason is to regulate our conduct. But since they do not represent anything real and are not rational ideas, but assemblages of the imagination, how exactly do they serve this function? So in the full version of this paper, this is just part of the paper that I'm going to be able to give now. I have a section on fictitious ideas. I have a section where I, at the end, tie this back to the moral discourse um, and the idea of the um, exemplar. But here I'm going to focus on the metaphysical and epistemological aspects of the argument. These terms are discussed and defined in early texts, including the treatise on the emendation of the intellect, the short treatise, the appendix containing metaphysical thoughts. These texts are significant for many reasons, but in part because they show the formation of Spinoza's system through his critical engagement with his contemporaries. Although Spinoza rejects some of the key metaphysical distinctions that underlie the late scholastic account, in particular the distinction between real being and being of reason, as we'll talk about that in a second, uh, and the number of overt references to this terminology terminology drop precipitously in the ethics, I think that the notion of being of reason persists in Spinoza's project in other forms. Indeed, it helps us make sense of some of the most puzzling claims that we encounter. Um, for instance, which I mentioned at the beginning, what that which claims value terms have no reference to really existing things, yet remain useful. Now, even as scholars have noted the regulative role of antirationists, Few, I think, have actually studied the mechanism that explain how they can pl play these various roles. A little bit, there's some. In a recent article, Carolina Hubner has argued that beings of reason are among those entities, like universals, that are, quote, constructed by the intellect in some way. What I want to do in this paper is specify the nature of this construction. I shall argue that Spinoza borrows from Suarez the idea that beings of reason are analogical. In Spinoza, there's a kind of double analogy at work. First, there's the analogy established between the model and the examples. Second, there's the analogy between the model and then the natural world to which it purports to describe. The regulatory function of beings of reasons depends upon the possibility 
of the similarity of the imaginative entity to, uh, imagine, to an actual being. So thus, I think, contrary to the claims of some scholars, for example, Deleuze, um, Schmaltz, Spinoza has not completely eliminated analogous relations from either his metaphysics or his epistemology, and I'm going to argue that this is true of the ethics. Indeed, I'll claim that the case of beings of reason sheds light on the nature of the imagination itself in the ethics. In particular, I want to show how the structure of an imaginative object depends on the kinds of analogy that we find in the structure of a being of reason. So maybe some things I say will have bearing on what the last couple talks have mentioned, some aspects of it. Okay, beings of reason and the metaphysics of analogy. The metaphysical status of beings of reason was a topic of debate long before Spinoza, and he's certainly aware of at least some of these disputes. The most important passage on this topic can be found at the very beginning of the Cogitana Metaphysica, which he appended to Descartes' Principles of Philosophy and published in 1663. After defining being as, quote, whatever, when it's clearly and distinctly perceived, we find to exist necessarily, or at least to be able to exist, he then goes on to distinguish between chimeras, fictitious beings, and beings of reason. A chimera cannot exist because it contains an explicit contradiction in its nature. It is, as he goes on to explain in chapter three, a verbal being, because it can only be expressed in words and not really even there, in the, he says, in the intellectual of the imagination. For example, the words square circle do not express anything that is possible or conceivable. A fictitious being may not contain a contradiction, but it also does not exist because it is the arbitrary, that is, through the will alone, um, joining of two unrelated terms. And the traditional example that, that uh, Suarez gives and we can use is the, the idea of the goat stag creature, these kind of mythological creatures. Now, being of reason is, quote, nothing but a mode of thinking which helps us to more easily retain, explain, and imagine the things we've understood, and more on this function below. Spinoza's worried here that philosophers make the mistake of, uh, that philosophers mistake the modes of thinking for things themselves. And this leads Spinoza to assert that, quote, being is badly divided into real being and being of reason, unquote. In order to understand this elliptical comment, we need to make a brief detour and try to see with whom Spinoza is arguing. Although Descartes' use of this idea of significant, I think in a longer version I've got to kind of deal with that, it's brief and it doesn't show, I think, any deep acquaintance with scholastic treatises in which uh, it had been extensively discussed. When Spinoza discusses the term in metaphysical thoughts, um, to which we'll return to below, he attempts to de develop the idea in a little bit more systematic way. In fact, it's likely that Spinoza adopted his discussion not from Descartes directly, but from some of his contemporaries, the Dutch Cartesians, figures like Burgersdijk and Herobord. Um, what Spinoza does, along with these other sources, is to engage more directly with the scholastic sources of Cartesian terminology. And what they had in mind was the work of the scholastic philosopher Suarez. In Metaphysical Disputation 54, Suarez discusses Antirationis in detail. Now, full analysis of this text is beyond the scope of the paper, but a summary of its key points is vital to understanding what Spinoza is doing here, indeed throughout his works. Suarez wavered over whether to include a section um, in his treatise on beings of reason. The subject of a treatise on metaphysics, he thought, must be real beings. But beings of reason are by definition not real beings, but what he calls shadows of being. As Suarez writes in the prologue, quote, since beings of reason are not true beings, they are not intelligible through themselves, unquote. Suarez argues that the cause of a being of reason is the intellect alone, and that beings of reason are real only to the extent that they are objects of understanding. While some of his interlocutors had on similar grounds argued, that a discussion of beings of reason was useless because they had no being in things themselves, something substantial or in substance, Suarez nonetheless claimed that, quote, cognition and knowledge of these beings is necessary for human instruction. Indeed, they are necessary to metaphysics itself, natural philosophy, logic, 
and even theology. So he then goes on to write this um, section of the work. In his view, there are several kinds of beings of reason. The first is what we call a positive kind, which is a relation created between two or more things, as the two examples already have given shown. This relationship is not based on any intrinsic qualities of the two things, but rather is extrinsic, or based on the fact that the two qualities they have have been placed together. And although this relationship apparently refers, apparently refers to something real, that reference, Suarez says, is improper, for the relationship is only analogical. A further relevant distinction among these so-called positive beings of reason is that between possible and impossible entities. Possible beings are those whose existence is not necessary, but also not impossible. For example, we may think about a golden mountain, which if, is possible, if not real. Impossible beings of reason are those whose nature contains a contradiction. And we've seen the square circle, for example, that was, which Spinoza refers to as his very nature impossible. The other two kinds of beings of reason are negations and privations. These are purely mental entities that appear to have being, but in fact do not. A privation of some quality is it's not itself a being of reason, but only becomes one when it becomes an entity that makes a positive claim, as if there is something that is not. Examples are nothing, absence, evil, death, blindness, and silence. The reason why they can be useful, even if they are not real, is that they are understood by comparison to true and real beings. Quote, for what is fictitious or apparent must be understood by comparison to what truly is, unquote. Although they exist only objectively in the intellect, beings of reason gain their value through their analogical relation to real things. In other words, their being is understood only in relation to the being of real things. And the classic example referred already is the goat stag, a chimera formed from the compound of the ideas of two real things. Likewise, the idea of a smiling meadow involves the joining of a smile with a meadow, a being that does not exist, yet seems to signify something with meaning to us. Of course, neither the goat stag nor the smiling meadow exist as real beings, but their component parts do, and the reality of the being of reason is found by analogy to those parts that are real. With his brief comments on the cogitata, in the Cogitata Metaphysica, Spinoza inserts himself into a complex debate, not only over beings of reason, which we'll come back to in a second, um, that Suarez refers to, but over the nature of divine predication itself. The problem, in a nutshell, is this. When we attribute qualities to God, God is just, merciful, etc., do the words mean the same thing as when we use them to refer, say, to a just or merciful king? In other words, are the terms univocal, pointing to God's intrinsic qualities or essence, or merely equivocal, pointing to the purely extrinsic qualities that we observe, yet may have no re meaningful relation to God's essence? The problem takes on a metaphysical dimension when we ask whether these qualities exist in the same way in the different instances of their use. In general terms, we can ask whether the meaning of exists in God exists and man exists is equivocal, fundamentally different, or univocal, the same. If the relation were merely equivocal, then we could not compare our nature to God in any meaningful sense. God would remain wholly unknowable if the relation were univocal, then the worry would be that we're reducing God's nature to ours. Aquinas attempted to solve this problem by introducing, via an appeal to Aristotle, a third kind of relation. And in the longer version of the paper, there's a discussion of Aristotle and kind of how this discussion of analogy is, draws back on those sources and used by the scholastics in this way, but I'm just gonna keep it simple. That is, the terms we use to describe God are extrinsic to his nature, but yet they point to his nature in a non-arbitrary manner. As we've seen, Suarez follows Aquinas to some extent here, and his view on entiorationis echo his view on the larger subject. The beings of reason do not pick out the intrinsic qualities of things, yet they are not entirely superfluous either. They can surely mislead us, but they can nonetheless in some sense point to something real without claiming to be real themselves. All right, now, 
So on the one hand, Spinoza rejects anything, of course, that seems to be equivocal in his metaphysics. He sides with the Scotist view that being is knowable through reason, and thus our true ideas refer directly or intrinsically to the nature of God. There is one God whose essential nature ought to and can be defined univocally through reason. On the other hand, Spinoza still wants to make careful distinctions among equivocal terms and defend the meaningfulness and value of some of them. Hence, whereas fictions and chimeras are problematic, albeit for different reasons, the former are possible yet merely involve arbitrary connections, um, while the latter are simply impossible, beings of reason are different. So this is the kind of the big claim here. Instead of eliminating the analogy of being from his system, Spinoza reconceives it in terms of his metaphysical naturalism or commitment to univocal explanation. At the level of rational explanation, there's no need for equivocal or analogical explanations. That is, from God's eye point of view, all the finite modes of substance, they act and can be explained in terms of the infinite modes of God itself, which is the combination of the laws of nature as they express through the total uh, totality of finite modes. But from the point of view of the modes, which are by definition only parts of the total sum of modes, all understanding will be partial based on the comparison of one part of the system to another or to the putative whole. Just as the action of finite modes is limited by the effect of other modes on them, so too is the understanding of each mode expressed as an idea of its own body, partial in relation to the whole. It understands itself not only as it acts in terms of its own nature, but also as it's acted upon by other bodies. Some of these actions may be experienced as stimuli to action, but they're conceived always in relation to other things. Hence, given the inevitability and ubiquity of these partial conceptions of the world, we need to learn how to discriminate between them, prevent their misuse, and promote whatever their limited epistemological value may be. The relation of beings to reason to the broader structure of analogia entis helps us make sense of a very difficult question. So here I'm going to try to make a stab at trying to apply this to a particular problem in, in Spinoza's um, account in, in, in his works here. Helps us make sense of a difficult question in Spinoza's metaphysics, that of the relation of whole to part, which I've already kind of hinted at. It shouldn't surprise us that Spinoza uses the idea of beings of reason in his early work to explain this very problem. We find the crucial passage in the short treatise in the second chapter of part one on the topic of what God is. Spinoza's concluded that, quote, extension is an attribute of God. And he's aware that many think that this view is inconsistent with God's perfection. They would argue that if God is extended, then God is divisible, which undermines his uniqueness and simplicity. To which Spinoza replies, quote, that part and whole are not true or actual beings, but only beings of reason. Consequently, in nature, there are neither whole nor parts. Likewise, in the second dialogue of the short treatise, Theophilus says, quote, the whole is only a being of reason, unquote. Now, the very same arguments are repeated in the crucial scolium to Proposition 15 of Part 1 of the Ethics, in which Spinoza claims, quote, whatever is is in God, nothing can be or can be conceived without God. The difference is that instead of using the term beings of reason to discuss the relation of part to whole, here he says that these ideas are a product of the imagination rather than the intellect. Now, of course, this new terminology poses the same problem as before. If the intellect refers to what is real, God's infinite nature, then what status ontologically do the imaginative ideas of part and whole have? Do they simply refer to nothing? If so, are we better off doing away, without, away with these ideas altogether? Spinoza's admonition in the Cogitata Metaphysica that being is badly divided into real being and being of reason should lead us to consider another way of reading this passage. The distinctions we've examined above between univocal, equivocal, and analogical terms can clarify Spinoza's intent here in the ethics just as they did in the earlier works. Um, Spinoza seems committed to the idea that the modes of thinking that involve part and whole do not refer univocally to God. 
That is, they are not true ideas of something that really exists. If they were, then they would be ideas of independently existing finite beings, kind of like Cartesian substances, and we have reason to believe at this point in the argument of ethics that this is false, that there is only one substance. In contrast, these modes of thinking are not nothing either. If the parts were nothing more than equivocal beings, then we could probably, prob uh, then uh, they would properly speaking refer to nothing, and we could do away with all mention of them. The existence of parts would be an illusion. However, if the modes of thinking that refer to parts and whole are analogical in nature, then beings of reason function in a different way. They are not merely fictions, arbitrary constructs of the will that do not refer to anything real. The structure of analogical thinking is that these terms stand not in a direct relation uh, th to things, but indirect relation. The imaginative ideas that finite minds have refer primarily to other finite ideas, the extrinsic relations they have with other finite beings, which we conceive partially and inadequately. Nonetheless, these relations ultimately stand in God in some sense, and th so the extrinsic relations refer indirectly to the intrinsic reality of the world. Okay, now, so here I came up with this very bad diagram in the footnote. Um, maybe, you know, being in a, in a place where, a university where Deleuze taught, uh, you know, if you looked at, read Le Pli, you know, the, the book of Deleuze on Leibniz, he has all these little sketches that he made on a napkin in a cafe as his diagram. So I was going to give you a little napkin sketch to kind of do it, but this is kind of the computer version of that. A kind of, I, I'm not very good at making these diagrams, but we'll see if this, this helps explain it um, at all. But I'll explain it verbally, and you can also try to look at this and see if it works. To be more specific, from the point of view of a finite being, we have ideas of innumerable discrete or finite objects, which we call X, Y, Z, etc. So you look below. These are not real distinctions between objects, but modal distinctions. The collection of all these objects we call the whole, which once named give meaning to the notion of a part, a term that belongs to each of the objects in the whole. These terms are neither real nor modal, but distinctions of reason. Each part is analogous in that, in that sense to the other parts, even if they are different kinds. Um, and, and, you know, I have a, a note here in, the, in note 19, Spinoza notes in the second dialogue of the short treatise, he says, quote, the universal includes only parts of the same kind, whereas the whole include parts of the same kind and another kind, right? So Spinoza is kind of aware that these parts can be of different kinds and yet they still are parts of a whole. Um, these terms are neither real nor uh, modal, but distinctions of reason. Each part is analogous in this sense. The whole, in turn, constituted from the point of view of finite modes, stands in an analogous relation to God as God actually exists. From God's point of view, finite things exist not as really distinct, but rather only as modes of, of his nature. From God's point of view, finite things, um, uh, from the point of view of finite modes, on the other hand, we can say that finite things are in God as parts constitute a whole. So the relation of part to whole is not how things really are in God's nature, but an analogy made by finite things to the metaphysically real nature of God. So when Spinoza rejects the standard dichotomy between real being and being of reason, he's not rejecting the value of a being of reason. Instead, he's pointing out that a possible misuse of the distinction, one, he's po pointing out a possible misuse of the distinction, one that leads to positing something that is not real as real. But with that caveat in mind, we can still use the beings of reason in certain ways. Right? And this is where I'm going to kind of, so I gave you one example of how it works in his kind of metaphysics of part and whole. Here's the next example kind of in knowing things, um, but also by analogy. Now, Spinoza tries to explain how precisely beings of reason can help us know the world, um, though in this apparently mundane account we find um, a rejection of one of the principles of Suarez's Aristotelianism. We find this account in the first section of the Cogitata Metaphysica and the TIE and letters from this period. Their first function is to retain ideas. 
This requires an active memory by which we retain some particular idea by linking it to something similar or putting it under a single name. Philosophers have frequently availed themselves of this function of a being of reason through the construction of classes of objects through ideas like species, genus, etc. What Suarez would have taken as true ideas about real things in the world, this is where he differs, of course, with Suarez, Spinoza reduces these things to mnemonic devices. Their second function is to explain things through serving as a mode of comparison. The examples Spinoza offers are time, number, and measure. The same topic is also discussed in the well-known letter 12 on the infinite. As he writes there, quote, from the fact that when we conceive quantity abstracted from substance and separate duration from the way it flows from eternal things, we can determine them as we please. There arise time and measure. Time to determine duration um, and measure to determine quantity in such a way that, as far as possible, we imagine them easily. So the third function, then, is to imagine non-entities positively as beings. For example, in the case of imagining negations of things like having real being, like darkness, blindness, etc. And these function the same way as Suarez points out. So Spinoza's use of these things in the early works refers, I think, pretty directly to that kind of discussion among the scholastics. As we saw above in the case of metaphysics, Spinoza preserves the various functions of beings of reason in his later works and also generalizes them into a larger theory of the imagination. Spinoza defines the imagination as the idea of the affection of other bodies on our own. They are partial because they express only one point of view of the complex set of events that constitute the world. They are confused because the individual finite subject does not easily distinguish the cause of the action from the effect. They are inadequate because they lack the systematic and law-like nature of adequate or rational ideas. Although each inadequate idea or image is discrete, they are invariably linked together in chains and combinations of various sorts. In his categorization of the kinds of knowledge, Spinoza actually distinguishes between two kinds of the imagination, which he calls singular things and signs. So I, this is, I mean, of course, well-known Proposition 40 of, of, of Part 2 of the Ethics. Um, from what has been said above, it's clear that we perceive many things and form universal notions, either one from singular things, which have been represented to us through the senses, or two, from signs, that is from fact, having heard or read certain words, we recollect things, we form certain ideas of things which are like them, and through which we imagine things. And these two kinds of things are the imagination. So there's, of course, a basic kind of similarity that's built into the very structure of represent, representation of bodies in ideas. But what is more important for our purposes is the way in which these simple forms of representation become conjoined together into more complex forms of associations. Spinoza recognizes that implicit in the signs we use, the words that stand for the image, is some principle of likeness that links together disparate images into signs that stand for something. How are these inadequate ideas grouped together? We can use the scholastic theory of analogy to account for the various ways in which images or inadequate ideas can be associated with one another. If the association is purely random or equivocal, then the signs are really no different from individual ideas. We will be able to learn nothing at all about the world. If they're associated via an act of will based on some artifice, that is, some rule that links two ideas together without any reference to an internal principle, then we have something like a poetic metaphor, an artifice that follows some principle that we have constructed. What we will learn if we examine these signs is nothing more than the artifice itself that constructed the connection in the first place. And this explains, by the way, Spinoza's dismissive remarks about fant fant liter certain forms of literature in the TTP, for example, his dismissive remarks about Orlando Furioso and things like that. Um, if the association is based on some principle that se seems to be internal to the things, then the sign will claim something more. It will claim to know the essence of things. Now, of course, this is where Spinoza thinks we have to be really careful. The, for only reason, not the imagination, can rightly claim to know the internal properties of finite modes. This is the peculiar danger of philosophy. It uses, or bad philosophy, uses the principle of likeness 
itself based on ideas of extrinsic rather than intrinsic qualities of things, to claim knowledge of the essences of things. This is where Spinoza criticizes universals that have been constructed by other philosophers. These notions they call universal, like man, horse, dog, and the like, have arisen from similar causes, namely because so many m images are formed at once of men in the human body that they surpass the power of imagining. They kind of get blurred together, and then we kind of say, oh, well, now we have this idea of what it is. In other words, what seems like reason is really the imagination in action, a kind of analogy instead of deduction, and we've mistaken equivocal terms for univocal ones, and this undermines what Spinoza thinks is the true um, purpose of philosophy. An explanation using these equivocal terms will not lead to agreement, but foster disagreement and discord, because each person understands the meaning of the explanations using these terms in different ways. If the idea of man, for instance, is formed on the basis of a principle of analogy, using either a partial set of ideas as its basis, or a single idea derived from experience that serves as the kind of primary analogate and helps us pick out others as lesser examples of the model. And this goes back actually to Aristotle's account of how analogy works, which I've skipped over here. It helps us pick out others as lesser examples of the model. Then we mistake the partial and the particular for the truly universal. Writ large, these are in effect the very same reasons why we should reject analogical explanation when it comes to knowledge of God or substance. What is actually particular is being substituted for what is supposed to be universal. All right. Now there's a further related complication. I think this goes back to the discussion we had in the prior um, paper. Uh, we start with the assumption that there are images of discrete objects. But since there are no metaphysically simple parts in Spinoza's system, that is really distinct objects, then how do we form ideas of them? There is, of course, a metaphysically adequate idea that we call the modes, right? And how we distinguish modes from one another is a complicated problem. I mean, some of you are surely better at explaining that than I am. Um, but from the point of view of finite beings, which is what I'm concerned about here, we more often than not have inadequate or confused ideas of modes. How are these inadequate or imaginative ideas of discrete objects constituted? First, I think we can go back to the discussion of part and whole, and we rely on that distinction, a distinction that functions on two levels. It makes the distinction between God conceived as the whole and God conceives uh, as parts of the whole. Then within this totality of infinite parts in the whole, there are relative parts and wholes which are purely relational. In other words, if the human body is conceived as the whole, right, my whole body, then all it constitutes, all that's in this whole body are parts of my body. Of course, the whole human body, conceived on a different relational scale, is a part, say, within all the bodies in society, which is, in turn, a part within nature. But how do these relative notions of part and whole become fixed as discrete objects um, within an ever-changing field of motion and rest? Now, there is an adequate account of the finite mode in Spinoza's system, which are there are a variety of, of ways to explicate. Um, and of course, this idea, the adequate idea, expresses the true nature of that discrete object or finite thing. But the question that faces us is how the imagination conceives of something inadequately as a discrete object, an idea that will only bear an analogous relation to the true object. So here the two-part process that, I've, that Spinoza sketches in uh, E2 Proposition 40, Scolium 2, becomes important. There are perhaps infinitely many discrete and inadequate ideas produced by the imagination. They are as various as the relations a finite mode can have with others, which is infinite. But we don't experience the world simply as a shifting field of infinitely many unique objects because we pick out similarities between objects of the imagination, and we're almost always engaged in the process of grouping them through analogy into stable kinds, we designate through names and signs. So there's an unending interplay between the unique object and its kind. The kind, the sign, helps constitute what we conceive of in the imaginative experience as a unique object. Because both are inadequately conceived, albeit in different ways, right, both the unique thing and the, the kind, the experience of imaginative singularity or imaginative kinds is always epistemologically unsatisfactory. 
We need to make sense of shifting particulars, and so we name them via some focal point of similarity in analogous relations. Yet these relations, these kinds are inevitably unsatisfactory because they can't actually give us an account of the infinite relational complexity of experience. Now, so here I'm coming to an end here. Um, does this mean that we need to reject the imagination as a path to knowledge? Of course, if we were God, we could rely on reason alone. However, as finite beings, we can't act solely according to God's eye perspective and inevitably are in the world of the imagination and passions. We've seen how, if we explain the mechanisms of the imagination in terms of the doctrine of analogy, we can make sense of typical philosophical errors, such as the substitution of one particular experience or set of them for the universal. We can also use it more positively, though, I think, to explain the utility of the imagination. If we described the equivocal world of images within the univocal world of universal law, then we can use analogical explanation, potentially, in some cases, as a bridge from the imagination to reason. Let's take a look at the famous example of a proportional that Spinoza uses to illustrate the kinds of knowledge in part two of the ethics. Um, and I'll read it, I guess, so I've got a few, just a few minutes. I shall explain all these with one example. Suppose there are three numbers and the problem is to find a fourth, which is the third, as the second is to the first. Merchants do not hesitate to multiply the second by the third and divide the product by the first, because they have not yet forgotten what they heard from their teacher without any demonstration, or because they've often found this in the simplest numbers or from the force of demonstration in the book of Euclid. But in the simplest numbers, none of this is necessary, etc. Um, the merchant has at hand, in this example, a procedure that links the numbers in a relation determined not by demonstration, as the rational person would have, but by likeness to a rule that he learned by imitation. It turns out that there is a rational truth to the matter, one known, say, by a competent mathematician, but the merchant approximates it through a procedure that's been honed not by reasoning, but by experience and the use of analogy to organize that experience. The fact that the merchant uses the imagination, and more particularly an analogy, does not mean that the solution is wrong. It's neither chimerical nor fictional. The solution to the problem is not, strictly speaking, on the other hand, true, because we didn't arrive at it through reason. But it's an approximation of the truth based on a kind of analogical principle. And the extent of the approximation can be measured independently by reason. But it can also be determined indirectly through experience. Deleuze notes that in the case of reason, quote, the application of common notions implies in general a strange harmony between reason and the imagination, between the laws of reason and those of the imagination. I think that the strange harmony also applies in reverse albeit less predictably. The imagination can arrive at something approximating the truth through analogy. The pragmatic value of analogical reason, then, will bear directly on the use of beings of reason in Spinoza's ethical theory. Thank you. Pas Pierre François. Bien, merci à Michel Rosenthal. Maintenant, vous aurez écouté la réponse de Jacqueline Lagré. Que tout le monde est sous les yeux. Qui n'est pas une réponse parce que j'ai vu son texte beaucoup trop tard et que je suis une couche tôt, donc je ne sais pas travailler la nuit. J'avais donc réfléchi moi aussi à ce sujet et vous verrez que nous arrivons à des conclusions assez semblables par des biais différents. Mais juste avant de parler, je voudrais vous transmettre les amitiés de Michel et Jean-Marie Bessade, vous savez que Jean-Marie Bessade est très malade, mais Michel m'a téléphoné juste avant pour me dire, tu diras bien à tous nos amis américains combien on est heureux de les savoir à Paris et qu'elle aurait tellement aimé venir, mais elle ne peut pas. Donc voilà, vous avez les amitiés de Michel et Jean-Marie Bessade. En métaphysique, la question de l'analogie est liée à celle de l'équivocité de l'être, en posant la question du sens de l'homonymie. 
Alors, je ne vous développerai pas la théorie de l'analogie selon Aristote, que vous connaissez, mais je rappellerai que l'analogie permet d'unifier des substances dans leur parenté tout en maintenant leurs différences. Spinoza, quant à lui, utilise très peu le terme analogia. Quand il l'emploie dans le traité politique, « coherentiam sive imperi analogiam observare », c'est pour signifier un rapport exact. C'est pourquoi Charles Ramon traduit justement « observer leur cohérence » c'est-à-dire les justes proportions de cet état. De même, dans les principes de la philosophie, Spinoza, pour une fois que je dis hein, quelque chose d'aimable à son endroit, il ne se sent plus, mais c'est normal. <rire> Donc Spinoza nie la possibilité d'une analogie ou d'une convenance quelconque entre l'impossible et le possible, ou bien le néant et quelque chose, car pour pouvoir comparer des choses entre elles et en connaître le rapport, il faut en avoir un concept clair et distinct. Le sens traditionnel de l'analogie dans la métaphysique scolastique n'est donc pas pertinent chez Spinoza, puisque notre philosophe soutient strictement l'univocité de l'étang. La référence adéquate ici ne serait donc pas Aristote, mais plutôt le portique, c'est-à-dire une philosophie empiriste et rationaliste, notamment dans le processus de formation des notions communes et par exemple le processus de formation de l'idée de bien. Pour Cicéron et Sénèque, deux auteurs que Spinoza connaît bien, L'idée de bien est formée par collatio rationis, ce qui est la traduction latine d'analogia. Elle est formée par une activité de l'esprit à partir des données de l'expérience. On peut pratiquer la, la collatio rationis par augmentation, par diminution ou par identité de rapport, analogie proprement dite. Et c'est ainsi que les hommes forment l'idée de bien. On sait que pour Spinoza, le bien n'est pas un étant réel, mais un être de raison. Bien et mal ne se disent que relativement, mais le bien n'est pas rien, ni un étant fictif. Il est formé par association d'idées et en relation avec le désir et l'utile. Par bien, j'entends ici tout genre de joie et tout ce qui en outre y mène, et principalement ce qui remplit l'attente, quelle qu'elle soit. Il y a chez Spinoza, comme chez les stoïciens, un souverain bien, qui consiste intégralement dans la connaissance de Dieu et l'amour de Dieu. Si, à proprement parler, Spinoza ne donne pas de définition du bien, c'est que le terme n'est pas univoque, mais relatif à une attente, à un désir, et donc qu'il récuse les définitions traditionnelles du terme. Chez Spinoza, il me semble, l'analogie n'a pas de sens technique, comme en métaphysique l'analogia entis, mais elle signifie simplement une juste proportion une égalité de rapport. En dehors de la règle de 3, qui est une analogie arithmétique parfaitement validée et qui sert de modèle aux trois genres de connaissances, comme on vient de voir, Spinoza observe des usages moins rigoureux de l'analogie qui relèvent plus de l'imagination que de la raison et qui produisent ces monstres théoriques que sont les êtres de raison quand on les prend pour des êtres réels. Je regarderai donc comment fonctionne l'imagination analogique dans ces deux domaines que sont la mythologie et la métaphysique. C'est pareil peut-être. Pour comprendre ce que sont les êtres de raison et leur statut théorique, il faut se demander comment ils sont formés, si c'est par l'entendement seul ou si l'imagination y joue son rôle, sans que pour autant l'ens rationique, rationniste, qui est un outil provisoire de la pensée qui n'existe pas en dehors de notre esprit, soit confondu avec l'ens fictum. L'ens fictum est la conjonction arbitraire de deux termes, il peut donc se trouver vrai par accident. Mais l'être de raison n'étant comme mode de pensée un outil pédagogique assez faible, il n'est pas vrai ou faux, mais il est bon ou mauvais, c'est-à-dire efficace ou non. Mais dans tous les cas, il est clair qu'on se situe dans le cadre de la connaissance du premier genre. Alors pour aller vite, parce que je n'ai pas beaucoup de temps, je me demanderai quelle est leur nature, leur mode de production et leur efficacité. Leur nature. Un ens rationniste n'est qu'un mode de pensée qui sert à retenir, expliquer, imaginer plus rapide, facilement les choses connues. La mémoire et l'imagination fonctionnent par ressemblance et analogie. Il en va de même pour l'entendement lorsque pour expliquer ou distinguer, il se sert de comparaison et recours à ces êtres de raison que sont le temps, le nombre, la mesure. Pour l'imagination, Michael l'a dit, Spinoza donne l'exemple de termes privatifs, la cécité, l'extrémité, les ténèbres. Si l'on veut considérer la nature naturée comme un étang unique, 
on usera d'une analogie entre l'unité du tout de l'existant et l'unité de l'idée ou du décret de Dieu qui le conserve. Citation du, des Cogitata Metaphysica, « Si ad analogiam totius naturae attendimus, ipsam, ut unum ens considerare possumus, et per consequence una tantum merit dei idea, si be decretum de natura naturata. » Donc l'analogie est bien un procédé de considération, une manière pour nous d'envisager les choses, de nous les représenter, pour les imaginer, les comprendre ou les mémoriser. Mais ça n'est pas un mode rationnel ou divin de penser. Dieu ne pense pas d'antia fictis, ficta vel rationis. Dieu ne connaît pas d'être de raison dans son entendement, mais seulement dans l'esprit humain en tant qu'il le conserve. Et il en va de même pour la connaissance des choses générales, des mots, des péchés, qu'il ne connaît qu'en tant que mode de pensée de l'esprit humain. Je passe à leur mode de production, puisqu'ils sont formés par transfert ou comparaison. Être de raison et étant fictifs sont formés de manière assez simple. Et ce qui compte, c'est moins la manière dont ils sont formés par l'esprit que ce qu'ils sont, ou plutôt ne sont pas, et ce qui entre en jeu dans leur formation. Les temps fictifs ou la fiction est formée par conjonction de deux termes, par la simple volonté non guidée par la raison. Et même si c'est un procédé rationnel qui implique une égalité, l'analogie fait partie de ces modes fictionnels, puisqu'elle compare, selon des rapports qui ne sont pas exacts, des choses non comparables. Surtout, comme on le voit sur le cas du miracle, la mise en rapport par ressemblance est un substitut fonctionnel du système d'explication par les causes naturelles. On le voit encore plus nettement en examinant l'invention mythologique et l'invention métaphysique. Le pouvoir de fiction est inversement proportionnel à la connaissance vraie, dit Spinoza. Il est donc impossible de forger la fiction que Dieu n'existe pas. Réciproquement, on peut facilement forger la représentation de la chimère en combinant des caractères appartenant à des animaux d'espèces différentes. Mais comme la licorne, la chimère est une fiction dont la nature exclut l'existence. Le cas d'Adam est un peu plus complexe. Adam est une fiction, puisqu'il est défini de manière très générale comme un être sans détermination historique ou géographique. Dans Éthique 4, 68 Scoli, Adam symbolise l'homme à sa naissance, dominé par le corps et les idées inadéquates. Il reconnaît en Ève sa semblable, c'est-à-dire ce qui lui est le plus utile. S'il s'en tenait là, Adam serait un homme libre mais il ne sait pas faire la différence entre l'homme et l'animal, et il imite le serpent. Adam, à sa naissance, ignorait tout du bien et du mal. Il a cessé d'être libre quand il a cessé de suivre les lois de sa nature, dont il avait une connaissance externe et partielle via l'interdit divin, et qu'il a confondu sa nature avec celle du serpent. « Moins les hommes connaissent la nature, écrit Spinoza, plus il leur est facile de forger quantité de fiction. » que les arbres parlent, que les hommes se changent subitement en pierre, en source, que des spectres apparaissent dans des miroirs, que le rien devienne quelque chose, et même que des dieux se changent en bêtes et en hommes, et une infinité d'autres fictions de ce genre. La fiction s'entretient elle-même indéfiniment, alors qu'elle est nécessairement confuse, jusqu'à ce qu'elle soit cachée par une idée, chassée pardon, par une idée claire. L'imagination métaphysique, elle, est encore plus prolifique que l'imagination mythologique. Et Spinoza ne l'étudie pas particulièrement puisqu'il s'agit là de bilveser sans intérêt. Mais on pourrait montrer comment, par exemple, les multiples âmes de l'homme, selon les philosophes, âmes végétatives, sensitives et pensantes pour Aristote, les huit parties de l'âme selon le portique, sont construites pour rendre compte des différentes fonctions d'un mode de pensée sans aucune consistance réelle. Il en va de même des universels, des idées universelles. Par exemple, la volonté ne se distingue pas des volitions et n'en est pas la cause. L'humanité n'est pas davantage cause de Pierre et de Paul et le désir n'est que l'abstraction de pulsion du conatus. Alors, faut-il chasser les, êtres, les étangs de raison puisque leurs effets paraissent plutôt négatifs que positifs Mais en fait, ce sont des outils qu'on peut orienter dans le sens d'une vie heureuse et libre. Je n'insisterai pas sur les effets négatifs, on les a longuement décrits, les fausses croyances, donc la superstition, les fausses explications, d'où le retard à la science. 
On a aussi décrit leurs effets positifs, la capacité de mémorisation, leurs vertus pédagogiques. Mais je voudrais montrer qu'ils peuvent servir aussi à corriger euh, des affects, des pulsions. Et je prendrai l'exemple de l'amour en essayant de voir ce que serait un amour du premier genre, du second genre ou du troisième genre. Puisque l'ens rationniste se situe dans le premier genre de connaissance et euh, l'ens fictum a aussi, alors que le concept et l'idée claire sont dans le deuxième genre. L'amour commence toujours par une fiction, mais il peut s'élever jusqu'à l'amour intellectuel de Dieu. Et donc on peut ordonner les différentes formes d'amour en fonction de leur correspondance aux différents genres de connaissances. Dans l'amour du premier genre, je mettrai l'amour filial, l'amour patriotique, l'amour du disciple pour son maître, et de même la haine, par oui dire, euh, l'antisémitisme, l'hostilité aux chrétiens, aux musulmans, je vous renvoie au cours traité 2, 3, paragraphe 8, et on connaît assez les effets délétères de ces amours mal pensés. En revanche, l'amour qui vient d'une croyance vraie, c'est par exemple le désir de parvenir à l'homme parfait pris comme modèle. C'est... Euh, Adam, cet être de raison forgé par l'imagination, mais que nous pouvons transformer en un concept, le concept d'homme parfait, qui sert de modèle pour orienter notre conatus. Et cet amour-là vise l'union avec une chose euh, qui sera de moins en moins périssable. Enfin, le troisième amour qui vient du concept vrai, c'est l'amour de Dieu, qui est intellectuel, et je dirais que c'est la même chose que l'amour de la vérité. À ce niveau, il n'y a plus de haine possible et c'est là que se situe le véritable amour du prochain qui n'est pas sentimental mais pragmatique et intellectuel. Pour conclure, si Spinoza dénie toute consistance aux intiarationnistes qui ont tant subjugué les métaphysiciens et qui les subjuguent parfois encore, mais je ne citerai personne, s'il évite soigneusement d'y recourir puisqu'il situe d'emblée son discours dans le deuxième ou le troisième genre de connaissance, il ne refuse pas totalement aux êtres de raison ou aux étants fictifs une certaine vertu pédagogique. Mais c'est un instrument qui ne serait sans danger qu'entre les mains de ceux qui, précisément, n'en ont plus besoin. Y renoncer n'est pas une perte, c'est une étape du chemin qui mène à la liberté et à la connaissance vraie. Je vous remercie. Merci. Bien. Euh, maintenant, en essayant de ne pas prendre du retard sur notre retard, quand même, on va se donner la possibilité de quelques questions. Vas-y. Oui. Ça Thanks for both papers. I learned a lot from both. I just have a, 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 a quick support and a quick question for Michael. So, in, in terms of support, I think that um, um, the suggestion that you make that uh, connects the beings of reason um, with the imagination is interesting because w one place where I think you can see that is in terms of the status of tempus, of time. Mm -hmm. And in letter 12, Spinoza refers to time as anti imaginationis. And if you look at uh, Proposition 17 of Part 2, you see that Spinoza is arguing there that the presence and present is basically a result of the imagination. And once present is imaginary, then the whole system of tenses is going to be imaginary. So that would go very nicely in your direction. Um, but the place where I somewhat disagree is uh, where you suggest that there is an analogy um, between the relationship of God to the modes and, uh, and the relationship between the whole and the part. And the reason is simple. Uh, basically, there, if it is an analogy, then it would be a very bad analogy. Why? Because the dependence relation in these two cases is utterly inverted. For Spinoza, parts are always prior to the whole, and he makes his statement time and again. Uh, and in the case of God, God is supposed to be prior to its modes. So the analogy would be, if, if it is an analogy, it would be weak would be a very uh, misleading analogy. Now, I think the text you pointed out is right. You, you pointed out a, a, a right text from the short treatise where he speaks about uh, 
a holding part as a kind of uh, beings of reason. I'll tell you even more. There is a, in the short treatise, you will also say that the imminent cause is both a whole and a cause, right? This view will be replaced in the ethics by saying that the immanent cause is a substance, is, uh, uh, the immanent cause is, uh, is, is, a, is a cause and a substance, it, it, the subject of inherence. I think that what happens is that in the early period, there, was, there is a short period of time where Spinoza is contemplating the possibility of holes which somewhat are prior to their parts. The place, apart from the short treatise, there is one more place where he makes that claim, and that's letter 32. He refers to a whole that is prior to the part. Mm -hmm. But the surprise, the interesting other aspect of that letter is that there is no reference to modes there. So the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the whole that is prior to the part is virtually, the part there is virtually the mode. So Spinoza is, is basically trying to work out with, with these different ways of, of conceiving their relationship, but I think that at the end of the day, in the ethics, the dependence relation is just working precisely the other way it's around. The other way around. Okay, I mean, I, I'll have to work it out more. I appreciate that. You know, I had the sense that, um, well, I mean, so I think that the texts I referred to were that, and also there's um, the dialogues um, in the prior note on Note 18 on page 7. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, let's see what he says there. I quote it. Um, those who put the on. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I, I have to check, to be honest. I need to work through it. Um, what I did in a prior version of the paper is I made this assertion and didn't work through it. This is my attempt to work through it. Um, but I'll take a look at whether I think that the whole, it didn't occur to me to think that the, the part is, that the whole only comes as the composition of the parts, the part is prior to that. Um, but I'll, I'll take a look and see if. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Yusuf. Other question? Michael, I just ha I want to ask a question about something, a note that you ended on when you said that the, uh, the uh, beings of reason, they approximate the truth, they enable us to approximate the truth. And so can you say more about approximating the truth? Are you, are you relying for degrees of truth in Spinoza? Is, is that what you're gesturing towards um, or, or is it something it's else? It's an interesting question, like whether, is, I think that, no, it's not strictly speaking the, their degrees. And I don't know, I mean, the analogical relationship. I mean, some things, I think you might say that some forms of approximation are better than others, right? Um, so then the question that I'm trying to figure out is why is that the case? Um, in what sense are these um, beings of reason or these imaginative structures similar to, in some ways, indirectly the truth? And what criteria you can use to, to determine that? I think that there could be rational ways to, that the rational person could use to try to make sense of why certain forms of experience approach closer to the truth than others. Um, so I think it can be a matter of degree, um, but I don't think that that's how the imagination itself works. I think part of it sometimes is just an accident or it just happens through experience over time that certain things turn to be, so that the rules that the merchant develops to figure out sums, for example, um, it turns out that some things work and other things don't. Those things are transmitted down and then they become um, used in a regular way. Why that is, the person may not, him or herself, know why exactly it is. Now, a rational person might kind of try to say certain methods that the imagination uses seem to approximate closer than others, so then the matter of degree would come in. Um, but I don't know if I have a good answer. I don't know if we can give that answer from the point of view of the imagination, except through experience. So it's a kind of pragmatic criterion from the point of view of the imagination. The rational person presumably can give an epistemological criterion that would be more sophisticated to explain why some forms of experience manage to approximate the truth better than others. Right. So let's so, say that I'm a, let's say that I'm a rational person, and so I'm looking down at this person using these uh, entities of reason, yeah. uh, and I can say that some of them approximate the truth better, some worse. Can I also say that some of these ways of approximating the truth better are involve ad ideas that are more adequate than others? Is, would you be willing to say that? Too? Yeah, I mean, I think then it would say that, well, maybe the person 
um, without thinking. I mean, so the political examples might be a good case yeah. where, and that's kind of got what we're thinking about this in the first place, how it is that certain forms of the state, even if they've been arrived at through experience, nonetheless can be better than others. Some forms of the state are better than others. So in the TP, he makes all these distinctions between different ways of organizing constitutions. So that was really in the back of my mind when I started working this out. Um, and so, right, then the rational person that knows, say, the laws of human psychology and, you know, very, has enough empirical experience could then try to say why it is that some forms of constitution are better than others as a matter of degree. And then it's like the person is doing something that from a rational point of view is inadequate, has an adequate idea, but the person isn't aware of it exactly themselves. So kind of that raises all kinds of problems too, as we know. Um, but it seems that so... Moses comes up with certain forms of uh, political structures that seem to work. They worked over experience, they see they're true, and yet he doesn't have an adequate idea himself of why that's the case, yet he knows through experience that it's true. The philosopher looking at that form of political constitution then would be able to say, yes, well, it's as if Moses has a rational idea, but he doesn't actually have it, otherwise he'd be aware of it, presumably. So anyway, yeah, it's a conundrum. Bien. Thank On va peut-être arrêter la discussion ici pour ne pas multiplier notre retard. Donc merci aux deux orateurs. Merci.